Good morning. My name is David Witte. I the, have the privilege of being the Provo and Vice President Academic here at VIU. And it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome you to uh, our Arts and Humanities Colloquium series. Um, one of the things that I'd like to do, though, before I proceed any further, is, is uh, recognize that we are in the traditional territory of this native people, and uh, we, we honor that uh, privilege and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to, uh, to use their territory in the delivery of education here in the Central Island. The, uh, the role of the Arts and Humanities Colloquium is actually quite central to what we do here. And so I'm, as the Pro, I'm really, really pleased to, to, uh, to see us uh, have this series. And, and, and for me, it's um, really central, as I say. Um, and it's something that too often we don't acknowledge in, in, in the hurry of the day. For me, um, central to that is, is the notion of critical thinking and the engagement that that brings uh, with it, um, both within our faculty, uh, with our students, and with community. The, um, and attached to that is that whole notion of creativity. And, and uh, my background in particular comes from that area. And, and um, I actually come from the area of practice in urban design, landscape architecture, and urban planning, actually. And so for us, in, in, in our practice, in our business, interestingly enough, we hired scud students that had skills. But more particularly, we only hired them if they had critical thinking and could demonstrate that. And it's something that I. I carry with me when I meet with other VPs and, and with, uh, with uh, the provincial government that from my perspective, critical thinking is absolutely central to, to what we do and, and in, in our area uh, of practice, professional practice, critical thinking was imperative to, uh, to, to the students that we hired and, and they need to, needed to demonstrate that. So I know at VIU it's central to what we do. I want to very, very quickly read you something. Um, that, that strikes at the heart of where we're at these days and why, why this kind of uh, conversation is, is so important. And um, I'm going to read you a quote from a publication out of the, uh, in this case, the Association of American Colleges and Universities. It's entitled Diversity and Democracy and um, Higher Education for Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement, Reinvesting in Longstanding Commitments. And, and uh, let me go through this very quickly. Throughout its history, American, read Canadian, higher education has prepared students for principled citizenship in a democratic society. But at times, as at present, when the rhetoric surrounding higher education has focused ever more sharply on higher education's role in fueling economic growth, it has approached these obligations somewhat tentatively. When it comes to forming and informing future citizens of the United States read Canada. And of the globe, however, now is not the time for hesitation. Now is the time for higher education to be both responsible and responsive to society at large, a critic of societal ills and a voice of what is good and worthy within current economic, political, social, and religious contexts. Now, interestingly enough, this morning, um, I just received the notice of a new report on civic learning and democratic engagement from the same organization. I just ordered this, this report. And, and that report uh, does this. It's a task force, calls on educators and public leaders to advance the 21st century vision of college learning for all students. A vision with civic learning and democratic engagement an expected part of every student's education. So as the Provo here at VIU, it's my job to advance it, uh, those kinds of notions, and I feel very strongly and passionately about that in this day and age of, it's more about jobs, it seems, than about broader education. So, having said that, and, and uh, setting that tone, um, secondly, community engagement is really central to what we do here. And so again, uh, I'm very, very pleased to, to be here to, to welcome all you, of you as we advance further engagement in, in today's uh, uh, discussion. I'm going to call upon Virginia MacArthur, prof professor with us, um, and a member of VIU's Department of Education to introduce our speakers. Again, thank you for coming. Good morning. 
As David said, I'm Virginia McCarthy, and I work in the Faculty of Education here at VIU. It's my honor and my pleasure today to be able to introduce Terry Doughty and Don Thompson, who are heading up this colloquium. This colloquium evolved from the 2009 conference, The Child and the Book, which was a collaborative effort among members of the Faculty of Education, the English Department, and the public school system. It was an extremely rewarding experience to be part of the conference, which not only showcased work from all three jurisdictions and resulted in the publication of a collection of scholarly essays, but even more, reflected a collegial team effort across disciplines. And besides all that, it was a lot of fun. I consider it a privilege to introduce my colleagues, Terry and Dawn. Terry Doughty is an island girl. He's directly behind me here. <laughs> Born in Nanaimo and raised in Parksville, she began her academic studies at the then named Malaspina College and then pursued an English honors degree at the University of British Columbia and graduate studies in English at York University in Toronto on a Shirk graduate scholarship. Her research interests include children's literature, literature of the fantastic, fairy tales, folklore and myth, Victorian girl culture, and late 19th century journalism by women. In addition to co-editing Knowing Their Place with Don Thompson, she has edited selections from the girls' own paper, 1880 to 1907, published by Broadview 2004. Terry has also published numerous articles and reference works and book chapters on topics as diverse as J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter books, girls' empire adventure stories, border culture in young adult fiction, and new woman celebrity interviewing in women's periodicals at the turn of the 20th century. As well, Terry has shared her research on fairy tales, literature of the fantastic, and myth at international conferences in the UK, Poland, in the US, pardon me, Poland and England. Terry's interest in border cultures and luminal spaces reflected in her co contribution to knowing their place is also a key feature of her latest project, an interdisciplinary field school co-led with Dr. Justin McGrail from Visual Arts, exploring the cultural contact zones in Wrocław, Poland in May 2012. Don Thompson, also behind me, comes from Calgary, Alberta. While finishing her graduate studies in comparative literature at the University of British Columbia 19 years ago, she took a short holiday on the island. The rest is history. She quickly applied for work in the English department at Vancouver Island University and has considered herself very lucky to live in this natural paradise ever since. Her teaching and research interests include the Canadian literatures, First Nations literatures, literary theory, and children's literature. In addition to articles on minority literatures in Canada, she has published Writing a Politics of Perception, Memory, Holography, and Women Writers in Canada with the University of Toronto. She has also published on children's literature, her most recent article being Dance on My Grave, Ambiguity, Ambivalence, and Queer Adolescence in the online journal, Papers, Explorations into Children's Literature, 2010. Please welcome Terry and Dawn. all for coming um, at what we know, at least for faculty and students, is a very busy time of the year. I'd also, on behalf of all of us speaking today, like to thank the Sunanemuk people for allowing us to meet and learn here together on their territory. As Virginia mentioned, this uh, all started quite a while ago um, with a few emails and a group that got together to organize a conference. The Child in the Book is an international graduate and postgraduate student conference on children's literature. Um, how do I do this back here? Is that, oh, look at that. Uh, <laughs> it was founded at Roehampton University in London, England, in 2004, and has been hosted by universities in Europe and North America, um, Belgium, Turkey, um, Oslo, and as you can see, we hosted one of the only two that were um, held on this side of the Atlantic. So back in September 2008, we started meeting to create this conference, and we were an interdisciplinary and, and collaborative group, as Virginia mentioned. Um, from the Faculty of Education, there was Virginia, as well as Heather Pastro and Carolyn Bowles. 
Terry and I from the Department of English, um, a mutual student, because Jen um, um, Jennifer McDonald had been in, uh, um, done a degree in English and then also uh, did an education degree. And really the, the instigator and the, I think about 98% of the energy behind the whole thing was Donna Plett, who was an Aboriginal education teacher at John Barsby. Um, we uh, had the support, we were grateful for the support of both of our deans, Harry Johnson and Steve Lane, and uh, the president of VIU, Ralph Nelson, as well as the um, VIU Research Awards Committee and the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council of Canada. <coughs> We quickly decided on a theme for the conference um, that was related to our own sense of place at a university which advertises itself as love where you learn. And actually on the human resources page, love where you work. Um, but also on an island and in a province that is celebrated for its natural beauty. So we decided on the intersection of identity with place and or space. This topic drew presenters from a range of fields. Um, we had. Uh, specialists in literature and history, library and information sciences, uh, early childhood education, education, Abor and Aboriginal studies. And they came from near and far. And this map shows uh, where all the people, participants came from. So it finally came together in uh, May 2009, and we heard a rich variety of papers on uh, focusing on realist and fantasy genres, multicultural, dias diasporic, and indigenous literatures, nation-building texts, issues such as environmentalism, bioregionalism, and ecofeminism, issues in education and uh, pedagogy, and various different approaches to constructions of the self. Uh, we had two keynote speakers, specialists in children's literature, um, Mavis Reimer and Perry Nodelman, who were extremely generous with their time. Yeah, they gave presentations on home and deterritorialization, on collaboration in the humanities, and on Lacanian theories of the subject. During this conference, we learned that in an increasingly globalized world, the relation between identity and place or space is contested and contradictory terrain. The spaces that child characters inhabit in literature and the ways in which they come to know and inhabit them affect them profoundly and in many different ways. Their stories, in turn, help situate and shape children who read them. And likewise, conference participants, I think, came to better know their places as cartographers of children's literature. Now, we thought that we were done when we finished the conference. <laughs> However, we were contacted by Cambridge Scholars Press and invited to uh, publish a proceedings of the conference. Don and I thought this would be a terrific opportunity for our presenters, and it also gave us a chance to enter the conversation that had been begun by the conference. When turning from the conference to putting together a book, we realized we needed a tighter focus on identity, place, space, and children's books. We took our cue from globalization theorists who recognized the local becomes more, not less important in a globalized world. As Apadurai notes, you can see on the slide, it is unlikely that there will be anything mere about the local. When the papers came in and we began making our selections, we recognized three key threads, indigeneity and diaspora, ecofeminism and bioregionalism, and fantastic spaces. One of the most basic tensions in children's literature is that between home and away. The chapters in this grouping address a kind of literary indigeneity with regard to genre and voice, as well as the challenges represented by migration and settlement. Now, I've put all of the chapters on this thread up here. The ones in green are the ones that you'll hear about today. Um, our first speaker will be Sheila Grieve, the end. Um, who enjoyed herself so much at the conference that she now works at VIU and is co-chair <laughs> of the Early Childhood Education program here. Sheila's research, informed by her Métis heritage, relates ethnobotany to child development. She is presented at Society of Ethnobiology conferences as well as at child care conferences and offers workshops on plants in the playground, art in the outdoors, and cooking it with plants. Our secondary speaker you've already met, Dawn, second, not secondary. <laughs> Her presentation will be followed by Dawn of Fletz, 
Donna in the middle at the table, as well as being a conference organizer extraordinaire, Donna is an Aboriginal education teacher for School District 68 and has taught at VIU. As well, she's developed Aboriginal curriculum for the BC Ministry of Education for both elementary and secondary programs. Donna completed her undergraduate studies at VIU and holds an MA in English from UVic with a focus on Canadian Aboriginal literature. She has presented at numerous conferences, including more than one Child and Book conference. I think you're the record holder here for Child and Book. <laughs> in our second grouping of papers on ecofeminism and bioregionality, uh, we see a, a mapping of the intersections of gender, spirituality, nature, <coughs> health, and regionalism. Janet Grafton is with us to present her chapter. Janet completed a BA in English and Liberal Studies here at VIU, then went on to earn an MA in Children's Literature at UBC, <coughs> research for which she was awarded a Shirk Graduate Scholarship. Janet has published in the journal of Children's Literature and reviewed Children's Literature for CM Magazine. She's currently working on a PhD in Environmental Studies at UMBC. Our last category, Fantastic Spaces, might seem a bit of an <coughs> odd one with so much of the focus on physical place. However, the imaginative spaces inhabited by children can affect their identity formation as much as their relationships with physical places do. Now, some of you may have seen uh, some uh, advertising that mentioned that Melissa Baczynski would be with us and she had intended to do so. However, unfortunately has been prevented. Uh, so today, I'm afraid you've just got me. <laughs> so. The collaboration that has produced this book extended through two years of hard yet pleasurable work, longer if you include the work on the conference. At the conference, Mavis Reimer spoke on the benefits of such collaborative research, and we agreed in conversation after her paper to dub it uh, after the slow cooking movement, slow research. <laughs> it may be slow, but the result is richly satisfying and we hope that you agree as you listen to the papers today. So I'd like at this point to turn it over to Sheila Green. and I was working on a lot of, um, in a lot of small communities in northern Manitoba. And working with the indigenous students there really enhanced my awareness of the importance of traditional lands and stories. It also made me very aware that the students did not always incorporate these values and beliefs into their work with children. So you began to see a disconnect with the community realities. What was happening in the childcare center wasn't reflecting the realities around. So that's you know, supposed to be a picture from northern Manitoba. That's a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of, the, in my chapter, I kind of look first at what are narratives? And narratives essentially are stories that entertain us <clears throat> as they help us form our perceptions of the world. They teach us about the land that we live on, and they enhance our ties to that land. The land that we live on influences our culture. 
Narratives are told in ways that reflect the beliefs and norms of a culture. They teach us survival skills and spiritual values. So those spiritual values then tie us back into the land and how we live on it. So it comes kind of a full circle that way. Narratives can also connect us to our ancestors. We perceive, we perceive our present in terms of the past. And narratives can give us hope when we're feeling a moment of despair, when we're feeling that we're at the bottom. We can look to some of the narratives that we know and learn from the teachings within them. The narrative styles of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people are not the same as those of the dominant Canadian culture. And when you're talking about children, a child's storytelling style may be perceived as incorrect or substandard when they're judged by people from a different culture. So it's really important when working with children that we choose narratives that respect a child's culture and a, that a child can really relate to. And it's not that difficult to find those narratives. Sometimes they're very local. They can be books that were written by elders in a community or other people in a community specifically for use in that community with the children of that community. And you can also buy the widely published books that are, that are available both nationally and internationally. I think the real value of the native narratives and using them with children is that they better reflect the home culture of the child. And when you decrease the chance of a child disconnecting from their home culture, you're increasing the child's sense of self-esteem. With a strong grounding in their home culture, children will be able to face the future as competent, confident human beings. I just saw so many more connections between your paper and mine, Sheila. Just different ages of, of, of youth. Um, there it is. Um, so my interest in Aboriginal literature ha is a long story, um, but it boils down to just how much I learn from it, be that about social justice issues or that wonderful feeling of trying to wrap one's mind around a completely different way of thinking and knowing, that um, a, a way different from my own. And, um, but I think the thread, the thread I'm gonna focus on today is how much after 18 years of teaching this stuff, I have learned from my students. So um, Sherman Alexie's young adult novel, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, and Eden Robinson's Trapline tell a very similar story. Both are first-person narratives told by uh, ab uh, Aboriginal youth in their mid-teens. Um, both of these uh, young men have been raised in dysfunctional uh, situations uh, at home, abusive situations, and uh, in severe poverty. Both of them are offered the same choice, to leave their home, their home and their family in order to further their education. Um, I'm using just a couple of slides here from True Diary because it's an illustrated book, um, and I think, but I think they work with both texts. So the absolutely true diary is, of a part-time Indian is a very funny and very sad book. Um, it's an autobiographical novel about a young man named Arnold Spirit Jr. who is isolated and bullied, and by bullied I mean beaten on a regular basis um, at home on his reserve in the Spokane Reserve. Um, he's bullied because he's different. On the advice of his teacher, he decides to leave the reserve and go to an all-white school in a neighboring town. So the novel basically chronicles one year in his life as he makes that decision, his difficulties getting to and from that school, in, um, when often his parents don't have money for gas or are not able to drive him, his challenges becoming accepted at that school, and also what he loses by making that move. 
Will, the teenage narrator of uh, Trap Lines, is uh, offered a similar escape from abusive circumstances at home. He's, uh, um, his, he's beaten regularly by his brother. There's not enough food in the house, um, and his parents are dealing with their own issues with alcoholism and are pretty neglectful. Um, <laughs> this time, it's his English teacher who offers him, invites him to come and live with her and her husband, where he will be safer and, and fed properly and be able to focus on his studies. Will, however, makes the opposite choice. As the story ends, he has uh, rejected the teacher and is staying with his community. So my experience teaching trap lines taught me to be more, a more nuanced reader of True Diary because to read one through the other, and I want to go backwards to my first slide where I was really proud how I got one title, one book cover inside the other there, but <laughs> I don't know how to do that, so I won't. Um, it reveals much about the vital connection that Sheila just talked about between um, um, indigenous youth and place. What it means to leave that place, which many find they, they have to do, and how that choice is perceived by readers depending on the place from which they read. Um, the main source of the potential trap lines in both stories is that both support multiple contradictory interpretations. And the differences between these interpretations are due precisely from the positioning, from how the reader situates the narrative. narrative. My evidence for this in the longer papers, both textual and experiential, um, what I learned from my students, and I'm just going to form a uh, focus on the latter for this uh, little summary. Um, it uh, highlights for me the kinds of lessons, that, the deeper lessons that I learned from them, and that is in that Aboriginal epistemology Learning is always a collaborative effort, and knowledge is processual and provisional. So in a nutshell, tra in Trap Lines, Will decides not to leave his community. And when I first taught this story, I thought that the reasons were, were perfectly clear. Um, it's a first-person narrator, uh, it's an unreliable narrator, and Will is... Um, Having been raised in the situation in which he's raised, he just he doesn't have the self-esteem to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, at first, he can't even understand the offer. He interprets the offer as actually a threat. And then when he realizes what they're, they're, they're offering him, he says to himself, they don't really mean it. They get bored with me quick when they find out what I'm like. At the end of the story, when he brushes the teacher off, she responds with, I'll talk to you later then. And he says to himself, doesn't matter. She practically said she doesn't want to see me again. I don't blame her. I wouldn't want to see me again either. The thing is, she says nothing of the sort. Um, it seemed absolutely clear to me that one of the trap lines in this, in this short story is his own psyche. At least that's what I thought until I taught this short story in a, an inter first year introduction to literature course. And a local elder was in that course. He taught me a little bit about the limitations of my own perspective. A culturally based reading, that is from a culture similar to the one depicted in the short story, offers another interpretation, one in which Will chooses family and community despite the dysfunction. And this interpretation is also supported by the text in much more subtle ways than mine and in ways that require some cultural knowledge in order to perceive them. Um, I won't go into the details of that, but what was really cool in the classroom was that once this gentleman made this comment, a lot of the other students jumped in and said, yeah, yeah, like look at how his father teaches him to skin a martin, and look at the fact that they used to take him fishing, and look at the fact that he, things are going to get better because the brother, who is the one beating Will, is being kicked out of the house. So together, they, they convinced me very thoroughly of this other interpretation of the story. So I'd had a bit of an education by the time I tried to teach um, True Diary in uh, a couple of different courses. Um, in this narrative, Junior does decide to leave and go to this all-white school. And in general, most readers seem to interpret this as a good thing. Students' comments are things like, thank God he's got out of there and now he's going to have a chance in life and, and things like that. However, just like in Trap Lines, there's enough ambiguity to support a contradictory interpretation. So this time I wasn't surprised when after a bunch of students had made positive comments about the trajectory of this narrative, 
um, one young Cree man said, he says to me, he says, Don, he says, how much do you think this book is about a sacrifice? And I says, well, what do you mean by sacrifice? And he says, well, it's about what he gives up in order to get where he wants to go. And that, of course, opened up another completely different conversation in which Junior's losses become very visible, as does the transparency of his attempts to rationalize his decision and the extent of the effects of colonization on him. In fact, um, it's way more complicated than this slide from the, than, than this illustration from the text um, exhibits. Read from this perspective, this little young adult novel becomes an extremely complex uh, text indeed. Um, and again, there's more about that, but what I found really striking in the classroom was that a number of the Aboriginal students spoke up then and talked about how much they identified with Junior. We had talked about how the character constructed himself to be sympathetic to readers, but they, they, they said it was much more than that because they too had had to leave their homes and their families to come to VIU. And they too were acutely aware of the losses that, that, that were involved in doing so. And to varying degrees, and we talked about it, the extent to which attending this institution entailed for them um, a certain amount of colonization of the mind. Um, and yet they were all no less adamant that it was absolutely necessary to make this decision. So, I mean, for me, there's quite a few lessons in here, but I think um, there might be a general one as well, because right now we're at a moment when federally, provincially, and very much so at this institution, we are talking about the importance of Aboriginal education, of how to encourage young Native people to complete high school and attend post-secondary education, and we're working on programs right at this moment to try to entice them and serve them here. But um, for those of us who come from a different culture than they do, I think that there's a, a lesson in perspective in that place creates perspective. And it's going to limit or condition what we can see, whether that our landscape is physical, literary, or educational. Thank you for coming, everyone, to the colloquium, and um, thank you for being here to hear my paper. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, anyone who's ever organized any big event knows that there's no one kingpin. Um, so I just want to just count some of that 98% stuff and uh, acknowledge all the other people who had a very big hand in making this whole project carried right through to publication, a grand success, especially Don and Terry as they fer ferried through the book to its conclusion. It took a lot of work. So uh, that having been gotten out of the way, um, my name is Donna Flett and I'm an Aboriginal teacher with School District 68, Métis, coming from Swampy Cree Territory in Central Manitoba, York Factory, and on the European side in the fur trading days over to Strom Ness and Orkney Islands in northern part of Scotland. Um, my paper is called Deepening the Reading Experience of Drew Hayden Taylor's Vampire Novel for Adolescents. It's about the Night Wander by Canadian Anishinaabe writer Drew Hayden Taylor, and it was published in 2007. And I bring up the date because I think it has importance later on. The situation that existed when I wrote the paper is I took a leave from School District 68 to do my Master's in Literature at UVic. Um, and then presented the paper. And my interest in the book was, um, number one, from being an Aboriginal person reading Aboriginal writing. I've had a lifelong interest in literature and books, and my first degree turned from education to literature when I was up at Simon Fraser back in the heydays of the rowdy hippie 70s. Um, more recently, I've had a, um, a compelling interest in Aboriginal literature, and I just pick up pretty much any book I can find anywhere and um, take it home. Um, read it obsessively in the morning and at night as well. So um, The Night Wanderer has arrived on the literary scene um, in such a happy, timely fashion, given that I was in a Gothic course right after its publication and I had free reign on my choice of essay. So I was down at um, 
UVic, where I did my master's in 2008 into nine, and the, the, the book had just come out in 2007. So further, the Night Wanderer fit astoundingly into the Gothic tradition, and its timeliness has another significance for Canadian Aboriginal peoples, given the characteristics of the Gothic tradition, which I'll mention in more detail later. Finally, I had briefly discussed the book with a high school teacher of English at the time, um, only to discover that her male high school teenage students rated the book as a girly book. And I took severe offense, and uh, so why would I not then write about it? I mean, everything just fell to place. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Night Wanderer's timeliness in terms of the Gothic tradition. Um, David Puntner's pointed out that the Gothic as a literary genre arrives at a specific historical time and place when people's or nation's identity gels, resulting from both a rise of economic and cognitive growth, as outlined by Ernst Gellner. Not surprisingly, this is also tied to a newly conscious nation's discovery of its language, voice, and literature. For Canada, the appearance of the Night Wanderer comes directly on the heels of an historic rise in Canada's Aboriginal population, specifically the under 27 group, which accounted for 50% of the growth of Aboriginal people in Canada between the years 1996 and 2006, a year before this book's publication. The Aboriginal population during that decade grew 45%, six times faster than the non-Aboriginal population, and this trend continues. The timeliness of this novel is also tied to a rise in the level of, academic, of Aboriginal education, which um, Don had been talking about, language revitalization, Aboriginal accomplishments in the arts and business, the recognition by non-Aboriginal communities, and a sense of consciousness both in terms of nationhood and individual pride for, for Aboriginal peoples. In terms of evidence to support this assertion in my essay, I looked at the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples reports and the testimony from Aboriginal individuals as well as the accomplishments of Aboriginal peoples in Canada and the history of the rise of the National Aboriginal Achievement Foundation and the corresponding glittering national awards ceremony for Aboriginal peoples, uh, much like the Aboriginal Oscars, if you will, um, associated with the NAAF. My main argument in my essay is that the arrival of the Night Wanderer helps facilitate the change and upheaval that accompany the developing consciousness of a new nation and ushers in changes to the culture of that nation that will engender the transformation and survival. Granted that we have many Aboriginal nations within Canada, but since the end of the World Wars, there has been a strong cohesive movement in Aboriginal nations to collaborate and cooperate. But the Gothic is never just a heavy-handed intellectual significance in its historic arrival. It would be pretty formidable read if it were, and you certainly wouldn't get any adolescents uh, tackling the book. The Gothic is traditionally filled with mystery, horror, romance, sexual tension, humor, wit, fun, physical slapstick, wordplay, and transformation, all charged with an on-your-seat edginess, and the Night Wanderer is no exception. It is especially filled with humor, attuned to which the rest of the novel dances. The Night Wanderer plays with the name of its villain hero, the centuries-old vampire Pierre Laurent, and people will have to forgive my French pronunciation here, um, Pierre Laurent, and Laurent was an Anishinaabe youth named Owl, which is very significant, who was taken to the French court of Europe um, by the early fur traders, where he was kept prisoner. When he's about to die from measles, he's bitten by a vampire bat. He returns after centuries of haunting Europe to his home reserve in northern Ontario to perform some undisclosed mission, which we ascertain by the end of the novel. French translations of Laurent and the alphabetical neighbors in, uh, uh, of the word in French dictionary give us multiple clues as to what Laurent is up to. He's all at once wandering, L'Aurent, a mistake, and Laurent, a mission. The heroine, and always potential victim of the vampire Laurent, is tender, tasty Tiffany, <laughs> teenage Tiffany. And she herself dubs the uh, vampire uh, L'Aurent, a mistake. So here we have an Anishinaabe writer writing in English, using French to pass on his message, transforming mistakes into missions through a journey, the vision quest. There is, of course, more. There's always more in Gothic. 
Um, pierre means stone, and we have the adage, in, uh, a rolling stone gathers no moss, turn on its head much the way the vampire in Laurent climbs down a tree on the reserve, upside down, that is head first. The same way the classic vampire, the Count, climbed out of his castle window and descended the steep walls while his prisoner Jonathan Harker watched in horror in the 1897 Gothic classic Dracula by Bram Stoker. In The Night Wanderer, Laurent is returning home precisely in order to settle old accounts and gather his moss. And we heard earlier how the Aboriginal peoples will choose territory and family over um, other, other areas of uh, wandering and existing in the world. The novel is filled further with transformations in the taking on of skins, notably the changing power of elder from the older and perhaps even destructive male to the younger, fertile, and promising female elder, Tiffany. There's a strong message sent through the trope of the dead hand of the poet past. That's the go very, very strong Gothic trope in the novel, and it's re represented by Laurent. He is colonization, the lure of goods from the fur trade, invasion, abduction, disease, dysfunction resulting from Aboriginal European contact, the residential school history, the displacement of Aboriginal peoples and families from their land, the loss of language and culture, and more. But if the dead hand of the past is allowed to stay alive and grip the present Aboriginal peoples and culture, it will quite literally in the night wanderer suck contemporary peoples dry. So there are plays on baptisms, seduction, father-daughter relationships, boyfriend-girlfriend relationships, missing mothers, locked rooms, owls, bats, identities, miscommunications, and secrets. In fact, there are so many of the classic Gothic tropes in The Night Wanderer, I said to my professor when I was writing my paper that either Drew Hayden Taylor had a phenomenal research team or he had great intuition. And Dr. Robert Miles, who is, is himself a Gothic specialist, said that he often thought that Gothic writers were able to somehow tap into a Gothic consciousness. And this sounds a bit mystical, but that appears to have been the case here, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. When my essay was published in this book, I got sassy, and I wrote to Drew Hayden Taylor, sending him a copy of my essay. I had his private email from a time almost 10 years ago when I was with the um, School District 68 Aboriginal Speakers Committee, and when Drew was not so famous that you had to go through his agent to contact him. So ultimately, through an email exchange and a conversation, I asked if he had any comments on, how my, es on my essay and if I could share them with you here today. So here's a few pictures of uh, Drew now. Blue, he's, he uh, has written under a title, I think, The Blue-Eyed Indian. And another one, and there he's reading uh, one of his more current books. Um, and here's what Drew Hayden Taylor has to say about his writing process and what he did with the novel. Alas, I did no research into the Gothic genre other than simple reading for enjoyment, so I came into it cold with, with an understanding of how I wanted it to feel. Evidently, I succeeded. Uh, and another one, um, as I think I mentioned as before, I did not study the Gothic form in any great detail. I'm a firm believer that all good writers are good readers and that all great writers are great readers. With that being said, having no university education, for I am a member of the great uneducated masses with a community college degree. I am a great believer in the power of books, so I read a lot and I soak up contemporary storytelling tradition through osmosis, just as I learned the traditional storytelling through listening. So I read a lot of Gothic books, and I must have absorbed the style and structure. Sure, I'll buy that, he says. Um, and one of these days, he plans to look up all of the people I mentioned in the references, apparently. Uh, and here's, uh, so finally, I asked Drew if he had a preference um, for the photo on the web that I should sort of steal to use for my PowerPoint. And he said, steal what you want in my pictures, just so long as I don't look too fat. <laughs> um, in many of Drew's recent photos, he's put on a few pounds, as we all do when we age. But in ending my presentation today about this delightful, charming, funny, rich little Canadian Gothic by one of our fine Canadian Aboriginal writers, I'm going to respect Drew's wishes and leave you with a picture of the fellow who once was described by Haida elders as pretty like a white boy. <laughs> I still don't know what that means. Um, 
So please don't let the pretty like a white boy uh, expression uh, stop you from getting a hold of a copy of this book and enjoying Canada's first Gothic Aboriginal novel written by the very witty and very funny Drew Hayden Taylor. It's not just for the young folks. Thank you very much. of uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery. It's set a bit later, about 13 years after World War I. It feels Edwardian. The odd car <coughs> the train is mentioned, but it's largely an industry and technology-free setting. Jane is 12, and she lives in Toronto with her overbearing grandmother and spineless mother. She's awkward, physically and emotionally repressed. But she's sent against her will to Prince Edward Island for the summer to visit a father they shot was dead. And there, in a little seaside cottage, she becomes the capable, confident girl who was never given the chance to become, she was never given the chance to become in her grandmother's urban home. And all three of these stories highlight the connection between human health and environmental health. And in all three, the authors emphasize and even valorize the benefits of a rural environment. So as a means of establishing a parameter for my argument, I'll briefly summarize the themes and the issues that are located in my analysis of these texts. Um, there are several issues involving gender, particularly with regard to the environment. Uh, in these books, the girls, they don't dominate their environment, and it was a common trope in boys' adventure stories from the time for boys to dominate their environment. Rather, these girls, they integrate into their respective rural environments. And uh, critic Mary Rubio, she notes that at the time that Montgomery was writing, quote, what is possible for a girl in childhood far exceeds what is allowed her after the onset of adolescence. Childhood is the only time in her life a woman is permitted not to know that her reality inevitably involves marriage." Unquote. Now, at the time these stories were written, it was fashionable in literature to depict girls as invalids or as tomboys who are tamed by story's end. But Burnett, Fisher, and Montgomery instead create girls who simply become sturdy and capable. The authors deliberately relocate the girls from indoor places and release them into active outdoor life. In granting the girls the freedom to explore green spaces, they also grant them strong bodies. Mary, Betsy, and Jane begin their stories as typical early 20th century protagonists and are transformed through the course of their narratives into something entirely new. Now the green space, um, I'll just sort of a quick thing, it's just, it's not wilderness that I'm looking at here. These are stories that are set in areas of cultivation like gardens and farmland. Now the illness, the way I, I play with it, I look at it in terms of being, uh, the state of being ill at ease. Um, being ill at ease is not diagnosed the way disease is, but illness is the experience of being unhealthy. 
and includes a set of symptoms. And I argue that being ill at ease is as debilitating as disease, and that it limits the girls' lives much as disease would. Now, because their original environments limit their first-hand experience of the world, the girls suffer from a lack of confidence, or are ill at ease and at odds with themselves, with others, and with their environments, and all of which have negative effects on their physical health. And the last one, transformation. Um, metamorphosis is a very common theme in children's literature, transformation. I think a few other speakers have mentioned it this morning. It's also one of the most fundamental processes in nature. And in my study, I look at how transformations in children's literature from the past intersect with contemporary perspectives of the natural world. Modern landscapes are altering rapidly, uh, as are people's attitudes and interactions with these spaces. Um, now, I primarily used eco-criticism to explore these issues. And eco-criticism, it's a young and evolving theory. It provides a new way of looking at and reviving classic fiction. And it's a theory that connects literary green space to the literal world. And eco-critic Cheryl Gottfeld, she asks, where is the natural world in the text? And in these books that I looked at, the natural world is located centrally and in opposition to the urban spaces is rooted in the pastoral tradition. The settings in all three texts are farms and gardens. They're places of deliberate growth. They illustrate the urban-rural binary of country as healing and city as noxious. And from a contemporary standpoint, the pastoral nature of these texts can be used as a model of sustainability. As a reaction to the rapidly shifting landscapes of the early 20th century, the authors were attempting to preserve the best possible version of their worlds. Um, classic English pastorals, which these author authors were influenced by, they are often criticized for presenting a vision of rural life so removed from the processes of labor and natural growth, they constitute a persistent mystification of human ecology. But Montgomery, Burnett, and Fisher revitalized the pastoral tradition by portraying the workings of the natural world in conjunction with human life, like seasonal activities such as growing food, making butter, fishing, and learning to swim in the sea. In these novels, the potential for pastoral literature to preserve environmental values is inherent. In my study, by drawing real-world parallels to these texts, and by considering the pastoral tradition the authors were drawn from as a form of conservation, these texts are recovered, which I would argue is one of the aims of eco-criticism. Now, in looking at how contact with green space changes the protagonists in ways that urban, li urban living cannot, I found the girls' transformations depend on the nature of their experiences within green space. I came across um, a number of articles that were defending urban life, particularly urban childhoods, in which the claim was made that many urban environments contain sufficient green spaces. But my primary texts show that green patches and park visits are not enough. Immersion is necessary for transformation. It's proximity to and activity in these green spaces that serve as an antidote to the dis-ease the girls suffer from. Now, the necessity of first-hand experience is promoted in these stories, and the confidence and wellness are linked to growing capabilities provided in rural environments. And to answer the eco-critical questions, um, I'm missing the slide, it's unfortunate. Um, one of the major eco-critical questions was, are people a part of, or part, apart from, or part of nature? Um, the girls do become part of their new environments by their story's ends. Mary takes on the qualities of her environment. She's described as smelling like fresh leaves and looking like a blooming rose. Betsy is described as a happy wild creature dancing about like an autumn leaf. And Jane, like Mary, takes on the color of her new environment. In Toronto, her hair is a nondescript color, but after time spent on Prince Edward Island, it is described as russet, which is an earthy fall color. The girls' transformations occur largely because they engage in activities that bring them closer to the natural world. I think there's always this danger of sounding elegiac when writing of the past works and places and of the environment in general. Um, books, such as the ones I looked at, they become artifacts containing an inventory of things lost. And with the rapidly altering landscapes of the 21st century come fewer opportunities for first-hand knowledge and experience of the land. The novels I discuss highlight the value of this space and this experience, just as they highlight the ill effects of losing or being denied them. As our landscapes and our tastes in literature continue to shift, the green spaces of text from the past will become increasingly foreign and inaccessible to contemporary readers. 
I believe there is a connection between endangered green space and texts from the past. These stories are living repositories. The protagonists of these texts come to know their places through immersion and primary experience within them. And likewise, contemporary readers can know these places of the past and further understand their own places through the act of reading. Books such as The Secret Garden, Understood Betsy, and Jane of Lantern Hill, they're dated and a little problematic, especially politically and racially, but they serve as a reference point for a moment in time when culture and nature were not so apart from each other as they are now. Thanks. Hi. So since we're talking about place, I want to identify the root of my paper, uh, which is uh, actually in Poland, which is a funny thing to say about a writer from Canada. But uh, in 2008, I attended a conference at the University of Wrocław that was very interested in looking at how fantasy literature for children and young adults can create opportunities for cultural collaboration and cooperation. And this is a really uh, pressing question, I think, in Central Europe as people uh, come to terms with various political shifts uh, and uh, border shifts in the region. So at the paper, or sorry, at the conference, I gave a paper on a shared world series called Borderlands, uh, in which the setting on the border between the mundane world and fairy provides a metaphorical contact zone for cultures. And one of the frequent contributors to the series is Canadian fantasist Charles de Lint. And I wanted to pursue some of his work further, particularly because he's often described as having a perspective that's uniquely Canadian. And I find it particularly interesting that most of the people who say this are not Canadian. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we can look at that later. <laughs> DeLint uh, is a writer who's always been fascinated by the places and spaces betwixt and between, whether fantastic borderlands at the margins of consensus reality, or the communities created by individuals at the margins of middle-class urban life. To enable his character's development, DeLint uses tools such as other worlds, border worlds, spirit worlds, and dreams, all transitional, and often in his work, transcultural spaces to allow his characters insight into self and other. This fascination with the liminal makes DeLint's work particularly appealing to young adults, themselves inhabitants of liminal space as they negotiate the terrain between childhood and adulthood, trying out identities to see what does and doesn't fit. Now the slide here actually uh, represents a, a kind of a rites of passage adapted by cultural anthropologist Victor Turner. And you can see that uh, it's three stages. There's a, a preliminal stage associated with childhood, uh, which is a stage of fixed identity. As a child, uh, you are placed in your community, in your family. You know whom you belong to. Um, and at the other end, there is another fixed state, that of adulthood, a post-liminal state, uh, where again, as an adult, you find your place in your work and in new family connections you form, uh, and, and you have a kind of fixed social identity. Um, adolescence in the middle is, is a kind of a unfixed space. It's a state of play. Um, in, in a liminal state, you don't really um, have a kind of uh, strong sense of yourself. Um, that isn't to say that you're lost, but it means that you're actually in a state where you're trying on different ways of being in the world, different ways of thinking of yourself in the world, different ways of relating to people in the world. So in the, the, the only problem I have with this, with this theory, I like that state of play and I have a lot of fun playing with it, um, but the problem I have is you can see by the uh, choices I was not given by PowerPoint <laughs> to have arrows running through the three stages, they're often seen as a, as a kind of linear process with an end uh, and I really uh, do not like that notion that this is a kind of set of stages that one must go through. Um, and in the past in children's literature, we've always seen texts which have kind of seen opportunities for being in, in liminal stages, liminal spaces, as something that has to come to an end. After all, we all must grow up. The Pevensi children can't stay in Narnia and so on. Um, but in, in, in 
terms of what am I seeing in a lot of young adult literature today, uh, there's a kind of fascination with that liminal state and a kind of questioning about whether indeed one must leave liminal space. Um, Karen Coates has mentioned, uh, Karen Coates, a, a children's literature critic, has mentioned that the actual subject of young adult literature is change. Um, and here in a globalized world, young adults or adolescents have to constantly negotiate their sense of self as they encounter transforming and transformative cultures and hybridizations. So in my paper, I look at three books by Charles de Lint. Uh, I'm not going to give you a, a summary, uh, a detailed summary of each of them, but uh, just to give you a taste. The Dreaming Place is a, a book about cousins who live together uh, uneasily. Um, the one cousin, Ash, has lost her family and is angry, uh, and Nina resents sharing her family with her cousin. The two of them are brought uh, by different means into a liminal space, a fantastical liminal space, uh, which in the book is called the spirit world. Uh, and in that place, they each encounter experience, uh, other ways of looking at the world. They have to take on other perspectives. They have to engage other cultures. As an example, the character Ash, who's from Cornwall, uh, enters a spirit world that, that looks like Southern England. It is, the, it is the landscape that she knows and recognizes, and the uh, symbols she encounters initially are those of Celtic culture. However, the longer she's there, uh, it transforms, and all of a sudden, she is in, an, in a North American forest, uh, and suddenly she is encountering uh, images and symbols from different mythic traditions. Uh, Nina goes into the spirit world, uh, and in her ex and and she actually experiences inhabiting a different body. Uh, she's a toad for a while, um, and in each case, I know I'm making a bit of a hash of this, but uh, in in each case, as the as the girls are in the spirit land and as they're forced to get out of their own heads, to get out of their own concerns, uh, and to consider that there are different perspectives on what's going on in the world and, and different perspectives on how they can cope with these things, um, they each experience a kind of transformation. Um, in The Blue Girl, the main character, Imogen, uh, is, set, is uh, at an urban high school, but she is starting to have trouble. Uh, she's experiencing lucid dreams and she's talking to a ghost at her high school uh, and she's being visited by by fairies. Uh, and in this book, she doesn't physically enter another imaginative space, but she finds herself constantly at betwixt and between times in her world, where otherworldly things impinge on our mundane reality. And she too um, is forced to reassess her uh, sense of her place in the world and her relationship to the people around her. And then finally, in Dingo, uh, the main character, Miguel, meets a dingo girl. That's a, a dingo girl on the cover of the book there. Uh, and he's drawn into their story, into the dream time, uh, where he too has to learn to give up his comfortable certainties that he's an okay guy. Uh, and, that, uh, and that he truly can inhabit other people's perspective. Uh, he he uh, comes to realize uh, in the end, at another liminal encounter on water's edge, land meets sea, uh, that uh, he actually uh, is somebody who might now truly be able to let go of his own perceptions of people uh, and, to, and to enter their world a little bit. So in all three novels, DeLint uses liminal spaces to show his protagonists and by extension his readers different ways of being in the world. When characters encounter multiple others within the contact zones of dreams and fantastic border worlds, they're able to dream themselves into new relationships with self, others, and the world. Liminal spaces offer these characters opportunities to play at selves liberated from the fixed identities tied to physical space and material reality. 
they're able to transform themselves. And what I particularly like about these three novels is that they do not end with the bright, shiny new character. Uh, each novel ends at an in-between point. They're not finished, they're not done. Conversations are in process. And so it seems to me that this is a, a good time to leave you and invite comments, questions, and discussion for any of us.